Abrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, we love you, and we adore you. Father, I thank you for this Shabbat and this opportunity to gather together as a Mishpachah's family to worship before you. I pray that as we open up your word today, that you will speak boldly into our hearts and our lives, and be your word heard and received, that nothing of me will be involved except that which you have ordained for this purpose. In the name of Yeshua Messiah, we pray, and everyone says, Amen. 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 So, just as a uh, quick caveat, um, I wasn't supposed to speak today. Uh, actually, Danielle and I and the kids were supposed to be gone today after uh, Africa and closing on the building and the unity service with the five Messianic congregations in the area and Shavuot last week and everything else going on. We were supposed to be gone. Like We were getting away for the weekend. Uh, I asked Elizabeth to speak. I actually told her, hey, we're, uh, we're going away to reset. We're just going to vanish for a couple of days and, and kind of reset. Um, we were taking our camper out and going to about an hour west of uh, Tallahassee, um, but apparently Alberto had other plans and decided he was going to make his way in, and uh, although I'm not at all concerned about a tropical storm coming in, it's just a lot of rain, this is South Alabama, we're used to that, um, I dreaded the idea of being trapped in the camper all day long, 24 hours a day for four straight days. Um, and I dreaded the reality of having to slice my kids for acting up in the camper trap. For no, uh, but <laughs> but we, uh, we, we decided uh, the other day that we were going to go ahead and cancel the trip. And so I sent Elizabeth a message and said, hey, we're, we're not going to be going after all. I just want to give you a heads up so we'll still be there this weekend. She goes, oh, sweet. You're going to speak that. Awesome, right? I was like, wait a second. I didn't even get a chance to offer for you to continue to speak if you wanted to. I know you've been prepping for it. Da, da, da. I was like, man, you just bell on it and hurt me. Put nothing to it. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so instead, you're stuck with me. I know most of you would rather hear Elizabeth speak than me, but uh, you're, you're stuck with me today. So, <laughs> so uh, with that said, uh, this morning we are in part of Naso, uh, which is from Numbers chapter 4, 21 through 789. Um, and we're actually going to focus primarily in chapter 7. Uh, there's a lot happening in Numbers 4. We're picking up with where we left off last week with the counting of the Levitical uh, families and the procedures that they would go through and what they're going to be doing. We're going to, uh, we, we deal with the, uh, the Nazarite vow and the Aaronic blessing, the the, 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 the priestly blessing uh, in Numbers 6 and a few other things as we move through. But number 7, uh, I really think, is, is kind of an interesting thing to look at. Uh, and I really want to take some time to, to navigate what the Lord's put on my heart with regards to this uh, for our community. So if you have your scriptures, go and open up, up to Numbers chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. Numbers 7, verse 1. It says, When Moses finished setting up the tabernacle, he anointed and consecrated it and all its implements, the altar and all its utensils, and he anointed and consecrated them. Then the princes of Israel, heads of their ancestral houses, they were tribal princes in charge over those who were, number, uh, who were numbered, gave offerings. They brought as their gift before Adonai six carts and twelve oxen. A cart came from every two princes and an ox from each one of them. They presented them before the tabernacle. Uh, verse 4, and I spoke to Moses saying, accept these from them to use in the service of the tents of meeting. Give them to the Levites to use as each man's required, uh, work requires. And then it goes through how many of each was given to the different families of the Levites. Remember, there are four, technically four families of the Levites. There's three actual families, the Merari's, the uh, Gershon, uh, Gershonites, and the uh, 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 Kohathites. Uh, the three main families from the Kohathites, you have a subfamily, which is Aaron and his family, the Kohanim, who uh, camp on the east side. And Aaron and his family actually uh, serve inside the tabernacle using the furnishings of the tabernacle as they uh, perform offerings and sacrifices and such on behalf of Israel to the Lord. Uh, whereas the other three families are each responsible for different things, whether it's taking care of and caring for the, um, the curtains and the various uh, outer coverings of the tabernacle, uh, or the, the structural support of the tabernacle, or the Kohathites, which is the family that Aaron's from and Moses is from, who are responsible for caring for and carrying the actual furnishings of the tabernacle. And when we look at this next couple of verses, what we see is that Moses divvies up the carts, the, the ox carts, and the oxen uh, to only two of the three families. The Kohathites don't get any. Anybody remember why? Everything that the Kohathites carry, they carry on their shoulders. 
Whereas the other two tribes get to carry everything on carts. They have to physically carry it. And if you remember when David is bringing the ark uh, of the Lord to Jerusalem, they're carrying it on the back of an ox cart. It begins to teeter and fall over, and Uzzah dies as he reaches up to save it, right? Uh, the reason that that all occurred that way wasn't necessarily that Uzzah's heart in the world was in the wrong place. It was in the right place. He was trying to, uh, to save the, the ark from falling over, but it's because everything about how they were doing it was wrong. Everything about how they were doing it was contrary to what God had said was supposed to happen. First and foremost, it was supposed to be the Kohathites, not just any Joshua from the army of David that could uh, move the ark. Second was it was supposed to be carried on their shoulders, not uh, on the back of a cart, which makes it a lot more secure in terms of hauling and not risking it falling over. The other two tribes were responsible for the structure, the curtains, and so on. And they got to use uh, carts, and their job was a little easier because they didn't have to uh, schlep it physically. Then we go to verse 10. Verse 10 says, When the altar was anointed, the princes brought their dedication offerings and presented them before Adonai. For Adonai had said to Moses, Each day, one of the princes is bring his offering for the altar's dedication. Bringing his offering on the first day was Nachshon, son of Aminadab, uh, from the tribe of Judah. And we see that this is separate from the oxes and the, or the oxen and the ox carts that were brought. They brought the oxen and the ox cart as a gift to the, <coughs> the Kohanim, or rather to the Leviim. And then this is the actual dedication offering, the beginning offerings for the altar uh, in the tabernacle. And uh, everything that's going to go on there. So now we see that they each bring each of the 12 heads of the tribes of Israel. There's 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, each of the 12 heads are responsible to bring an offering uh, to the tabernacle. And what's really interesting is there's 89 verses in chapter 7. Right? And beginning with verse 12 is where we start to read what each of these offerings are. So for 67 verses, we read the offerings that are brought before uh, the Lord in the tabernacle. And if you pay attention to them, and I'm not going to read through each and every one of them, but I am going to read through the first one with Judah. It says, verse 13, his offering was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels, one silver basin weighing 70 shekels by the shekel of the sanctuary. Both of them filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering, one ladle of 10 shekels of gold filled with incense, one young bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old as a burnt offering, one male goat as a sin offering, and two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs. Uh, sounds like a Christmas song. Uh, one, year old to, <laughs> one year old to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Nachshon, son of uh, Aminadab. Uh, and then as we move through the rest of this, you'll notice that it just replicates. Over and over and over again, the exact same offerings, the exact same silver plates, the exact same ladles, the exact same animals, the exact same numbers of everything across the board. All 12 tribes bring the exact same offerings. And as we look at it, the way that they go about bringing the offerings was first was the tribe of Judah. And if you remember, each of the, the four sides of the tabernacle were where the, the camps of Israel uh, camped, the, the tribes of Israel camped. And there were actually four heads of those camps as the thunder begins to clap outside. There were four heads of those camps. First was the, the camp of Judah, and within that were Judah, Issachar, and Zebulon. Second was the camp of Reuben. Within that was Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. Uh, or God, uh, Camp Dan had Ephraim, uh, sorry, Camp Ephraim and Ephraim at Manasseh and Benjamin, Camp Dan had Dan, Naphtali, and Asher, uh, and each of these had heads of those, so Judah, Reuben, Ephraim, and Dan were the heads of those three, the four camps, there were three tribes within each camp, and as they bring their offerings, it starts with the tribe of Judah, and the eastward camp, the camps that are right in front of the east side of the tabernacle, which is the entrance to the tabernacle. And each of those three tribes were the first three to bring their offerings. So it was Judah, then Issachar, then Zebulon. And then it moves to the south side, uh, the, the, the tribes that camp on the south side. And then Reuben, Simeon, and Gad each bring their offerings on respective days. And then it moves to the west side. And you've got Ephraim and Asher and uh, Benjamin that each bring their offerings on respective days. And then uh, the camp of, uh, of uh, um, Dan, you've got Dan, Naphtali, and Asher. Each of them bring their offerings on respective days. And so for 12 total days, there are offerings brought one day from each tribe. And each tribe brings the exact same offering across the board. And yet the Lord takes up an equal amount of space in the Torah to describe each offering to the point, to the letter of each tribe for each of those 12 days. And it's really interesting to look at because what we realize as we move through this is that the Lord is no respecter of persons. He's no respecter of tribes. 
each of the tribes of Israel had something to offer. Right? Each tribe had something to give. And we see that right out the gate with the Leviim, the tribe of Levite, who became the priestly tribe and the servants of the tabernacle and the temple. We see that from the tribe of Judah, and from the tribe of Judah we get the, uh, the kingship lineage of Israel and so on and so forth. Each camp had something to offer and in this case literally had a physical offering to bring to the tabernacle at its dedication at the beginning of the service of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And each camp brought the same exact offering. Offering. And the Lord thought so much of each one that he didn't differentiate in the amount of time. He could have very easily said, right out the gate, all right, each of the 12 tribes brought an offering one day each tribe. And each of them brought these things, boom, in 10 verses. It's covered instead of 67 verses. But the Lord decided to take 67 verses to describe each individual tribe, each individual offering on each individual day. So that we would recognize and understand that no matter who, what tribe they come from, no matter what family they come from, no matter what offering was brought before the Lord, each and every one is equated the same. Each one means the same to the Lord. None uh, uh, fade away to the background. None are more important than the other. None are more uh, is the Lord more concerned about than the other. None is the Lord more willing to receive offering from than the other. And most importantly, none of them are any less of value for the Lord's salvation. Than the next. As we look through Israel's journey uh, into the promised land and ultimately their experience in the promised land, their expulsion from the promised land, their being brought back to the promised land, one of the things that we notice is throughout the history of Israel, there's never a point in time where any single tribe is singled out as being more special or better than another one. And also, what's really interesting is there's never a point in the history of the nation of Israel that the Lord forsakes or walks away from any single tribe. He holds on to the reality of all Israel. As a matter of fact, when Israel comes back after the Babylonian captivity, every single tribe was represented in the nation of Israel. Before Israel was taken to the Babylonian captivity, captivity even after the, the, the northern tribes, the, camp, uh, the nation of Israel, the northern uh, nation was dispersed, the northern kingdom was dispersed, uh, those before the dispersion of the northern kingdom that wanted to serve the Lord all moved down south where the temple was and where the service of the Lord was still going on, where they hadn't completely forsaken the Lord. And so even in the, the kingdom of Judah and the nation of Judah under the, the, the kingship of the lineage of Judah, the lineage of David, all of the tribes were represented there. When we go forward to uh, the, the New Testament era, the New Testament days, if you would, we recognize that all the tribes were represented, although we don't necessarily see every one of their names in the Baruch HaBashah, the New Covenant, the New Testament, all of them were represented. And we recognize, as the Lord says, that uh, he would leave the 99 to go find the one that God's desire is that each and every person in the house of Israel is saved. And even more so being Israel is merely a uh, remnant of the nations of the world. His desire is that each and every person be saved, that each and every person be used for the good and glory of his kingdom. And no matter what your life experience is versus my life experience, if it were written in the word of God, I would have no more of a uh, uh, passage, size, uh, passage size than you would. In the same sense that no tribe had a larger passage size than the other in description of the offerings that they brought before the Lord. And I think it's really interesting because these offerings were, in essence, an effort of the nations of the, the tribes of the nation of Israel to serve the Lord, to bring from their heart to the Lord. And each one brought an offering, and the Lord felt it so important that he laid them all out in order sequentially as they were brought, even though they were the exact same thing. I don't know about you. I like efficiency. I'm not going to waste Look, my hand would start hurting having to write all of those over and over and over and over again. It would drive me bonkers having to do that. Not to mention that I, I have some mild OCD tendencies and formatting would be a pain because uh, I would have to make sure that it was formatted just right, that it all fit in the same amount of space. And uh, I don't think God's quite as crazy as I am there. But uh, nonetheless, I wouldn't have wasted the time and effort in the same sense that if I were God, I wouldn't have wasted the time and effort to create us knowing we were going to sin anyways. But thankfully, I'm not God. And every one of you agrees. Um, thankfully, I'm not God. And he took the time to do this. And, and I think it's really important for us as believers to grasp and to hold on to and to understand that, uh, that the Lord took the time to lay that out for a very specific reason. And he was trying to show us that there wasn't any tribe that was greater than the other. There wasn't any tribe that he valued 
more than the other. There wasn't any tribe that was held to a greater covenant than the other. There wasn't any tribe that was held to a greater responsibility than the other. And there wasn't any tribe that he cherished more than the other. In the same sense, we see that with the Talmudim, the disciples and the, the Gospels, that the Lord holds them all. Although John says he was the one that the Lord loved most. Uh, but but we, we don't see him showing any favoritism, per se, to any one versus another. We do see the encounter with Peter at the end, uh, after Yeshua's been resurrected, and he's kind of redeeming uh, uh, Peter's denial of him and so on. But we don't see anywhere in the Gospels where he took more to one disciple than another. Uh, he loved them all equally. He called them all to serve them equally. And although there was some that he held closer in terms of friendship and ministry, there were none that was more important or less important than the other. And so we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 4. It says, Now there are various kinds of gifts for the same Ruach, the same Spirit. There are various kinds of service for the same Lord. There are various kinds of workings for the same God who works all things and all people. But to each person is given the manifestation of the Ruach, the Spirit, for the benefit of all. For to one is given through the Ruach a word of wisdom, to another a word of knowledge according to the same Ruach, to another faith by the same Ruach, to another gifts of healings by the same, uh, by the one Ruach, to another workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But the one, uh, but one and the same Ruach activates all these things, distributing to each person individually as he wills, as the Lord wills, not as we will, but as the Lord wills. Verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many parts and all the parts of the body, though many are one body, so also is Messiah. For in one Ruach, we were all immersed into one body, whether Jewish or Greek, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one Ruach, of one spirit. These are powerful words. This is a powerful image because each and every one of us, just like the tribes of Israel, the Lord had a purpose for each individual tribe. No doubt about it. We can see it, like I said, right out the gate with Levi and with uh, Judah. We can see right out the gate that he had a purpose with each and every tribe. He had a calling, a distinct uh, necessity in the nation of Israel that they each were to play and a role that they were to play. But the Lord counted each tribe and each individual in those tribes. He counted each one of them as the same in his eyes. And they were all given the same equal amounts of, of scriptural passage to describe the offerings and service they brought before the Lord. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see that the same uh, uh, idea is being given here by Paul. As he says, the Spirit of God is going to work in each and every one of us in different ways. As the Lord sees fit, as his, He needs, as His will is. Not as you and I want, not as you and I wish, not as you and I desire, but as He wishes and desires for the good of His kingdom and the glory of His name. The Spirit of God moves, but it's the same Spirit that moves in each of us, that operates through each of us in each of the different ways. And as we bring our offering, I don't care if when worship is going on, if you're the kind of person that falls on your face before the Lord and is just soaking the carpet in tears and snot because the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Or if you're a person that's in the back or in the front that's dancing uh, with, with an unbridled, unashamed passion for the Lord. Or if you're a person up on the stage helping lead worship and playing instruments. Or if you're a person that's waving flags around. Or if you're a person that's uh, uh, sitting in the chair reading your word, the word of God, just soaking in the presence. Or any other way that you can find to worship. I don't care which one you fall in the category of. You're no less or no more valuable to the Lord than anyone else in the room worshiping with you in that moment. And the Lord desires each and every one of those offerings of worship because he created each and every one of us for those purposes. And he's got a reason for it, for the good and the glory of his kingdom. And although we may look at somebody else's giftings, you know, my gifting, I, I would like to think, is, is teaching and, and leadership and such. Uh, you may disagree with me on there, I don't know. Uh, but my, my gifting, I think, is in that area. And you may have a different gifting. You may have a gifting in healing. You may have a gifting in discernment. You have a gifting, I hope that we all have some degree of discernment. Uh, but there's definitely a, a gifting in that area from the Spirit of God. And, and you may operate these different giftings. And, and in each of us, the Lord may decide that we're going to experience a different gifting at a different moment for different purposes based off of His will and His purposes for His glory, His name, and His kingdom. But it doesn't matter what you operate in or what you don't operate in. We have no right to look at the person next to us and go, why can't I do what they're doing? I don't look at a worship leader going, why can't I have that gifting? Why can't I lead worship? I don't look at a, a person gifted to teach children and go, why can't I do that? Why don't I have that gifting? Because the Lord has given me a gifting and a purpose for His kingdom 
that may be different than what somebody else is doing, but it's what he's created me for. And he's given me an equal portion of that gifting as he has the gifting he's given to somebody else. And for the same purpose. And the same spirit that operates in me operates in you for the same purpose and the good of his kingdom. And we have no right to compare ourselves to everyone else or anyone else because the offering that we bring is exactly the same as the offering that the S person brings. It may look a little different. It may come from a different person. It may come from a different tribe. It may come from a different language. It may come from a different place. But we are exactly the same in the eyes of the Lord, bringing an offering before the God of all creation. And then he goes on. In verse 27, now you are the body of Messiah and members individually. God has put into his community for his emissaries, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then healings, helps, leadership, various kinds of tongues. All are not emissaries, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All do not work miracles, do they? All do not have the gift of healing, do they? All do not speak in tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts. And still I show you a far better way. And he jumps right into chapter 13 talking about the gift of love, which is something we should all operate in equally and powerfully in. But I just want to hone in on that 27 through 30 because the Lord has many gifts. And, and I don't think that this list is concise. I'm not willing to say that this is the only way God operates. Because I believe that God will use us for different things at different times and that he may have even greater gifts. I know people that when the spirit of the Lord falls, they begin to speak in tongues in a mighty and powerful way and there's somebody next to them that may start to interpret or what have you. I know people that when the spirit of God falls, they just bawl their eyes out uncontrollably. There's nothing else they can do but just sit there and bawl their eyes out. I know people that are on their faces. I know people that are raising their hands. I, and we each approach it a little different. And, and these aren't necessarily all gifts, but it's the way the spirit of God moves in us. And I believe that there's so much more that the Lord can and wants to do through us if we simply open our hearts up to let him move in our lives and in our midst and let him have the, the, the freedom and the reign in our lives that he rightly deserves and is due. But no matter what he does through you and I, we have no right to compare ourselves to anybody else. We have no right to desire what the Lord is doing through somebody else. Because the reality is, is in terms of space on a page, if our story was being written as it was with the offerings brought by the nation of Israel and Parsha, not so, it would take up the exact same amount of space. And it would look exactly the same. Because in the eyes of God and the eyes of man don't necessarily line up the same. What God sees and what we see do not necessarily line up the same. Which is why we don't see the grand picture, the big picture of what's going on around us. But we can see the here and now and why it's so much more important that we are ever uh, constantly seeking the leading and the guidance of the presence of the Lord and the Spirit of the Lord in our lives. Because otherwise, we're going to be chasing this and that and the other not realizing that the Lord has a bigger picture happening around us. And we seem to be on the wrong side of it at all times. But if we follow his leading in everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that the Lord wants to do through us, guess what? Right. When the bigger picture all plays out, we've been a part of everything the Lord wants to use right. us in. And when the bigger picture plays out, as part of the body of Messiah, we're all part of one body. My part, my role as an arm, and I don't know that I necessarily have an arm, but just using that as an example, my role as an arm, as Paul says in other places, my role as an arm is not the same as uh, somebody whose role is to be a knee, right? Somebody who's supposed to be an ear is not going to be the same as somebody that's supposed to be a big toe. Somebody that's supposed to be a piece of hair is not going to be the same as somebody that's supposed to be a gut, right? We're all going to have different uh, roles and functions, but it's one body operating and moving, and it should flow naturally. That's right. Because what brings us together, what holds us together is the Spirit of the Lord, which is what should be operating through us. And I love the fact that in this week's Parsha, chapter 7 of Numbers, we see that the Lord gives equal ground and accepts equal offering from each of the tribes. Because in reality, our worship is our offering. Our service and the calling and function the Lord has given us giftings and talents in is our offering. And I don't care if you're a person leading worship, teaching the children, or cleaning the bathrooms. In the eyes of the Lord... Yours is equally as important as the next person's. Amen. Your role and your calling and your purpose is equally as important as the next person. I may be the rabbi, but in terms of the body of Messiah that we represent here, I'm merely a figurehead. Because my role as the rabbi is no more important than our elders, 
than our worship leaders, our worship team members, our teachers, the people that help uh, orchestrate the inventory to make sure we have enough plates and cups and bowls and stuff for one the people that make sure that the rabbi has enough coffee to be satisfied. <laughs> we all have our purpose, our giftings, and our talents. And if we spend all of our time focusing on what the next guy did, I mean, imagine if the 12 tribes had each brought different things at the dedication of the, uh, the altar. As much as they battled against, I mean, we don't even get a couple of chapters in the judges before each of the tribes are now in each other's throats, right? As much as they battled against each other when we got into the promised land, you think they would have survived being in the wilderness and some one tribe, Judah, bringing 15 oxen and, and uh, Dan only bringing a couple of turtle doves? You think they would have gotten along okay there? Wouldn't have worked. Would have never worked. It would have exploded. Actually, everything would have imploded is probably more likely. Cain and Abel. We cannot get Cain and Abel. Great example. Thank you, Chris. Cain and Abel. Both had the same heart. Believe it or not, both are bringing tithes of what they brought. But one wish he brought to the other bride. One wish his offering was the same. But the reality is, is God didn't create you to do the same things I do. He didn't create me to do the same things you do. That's right. That's right. He created us. He gave us gifts and talents for a very specific purpose within his kingdom. And we can't compare ourselves to the person next to us. But in the eyes of the Lord, just like with the 12 tribes and their <laughs> offerings, in the eyes of the Lord... When we do bring our offerings to the dedication of the altar, they're exactly the same. We're each bringing five oxen. We're each bringing five male goats and female goats or however else the song was described. We're each bringing all these different things to the Lord. Because in His eyes, each of us are equal in value and importance. And each of us has an equal role in seeing His kingdom fulfilled here on earth. Each of us has a very vital and important role in seeing the kingdom of the Lord be a reality here on earth. Not just when the new heaven, new Jerusalem descend upon the earth, but here and now. Because the gospel say the kingdom of God is upon us. Which means you and I, as parts of that kingdom, must operate in a kingdom-minded nature. Not focused on what I have and you don't have, or what you have and I don't have, or whatever else but operating what the Lord has uniquely given each of us for his purpose. And in the body, each and every single part of the human body plays a very vital and important role. If you don't believe me, go look at the value of having all of your toes while you're trying to walk. Just go research how important that annoying little toe really is. Try and hold a cup of water without an opposable thumb. Try to drive with one eye closed. Don't try that for real. <laughs> but, but the reality is each and every part of the body of Messiah is equally vital and important in the eyes of the Lord. And each and every part that we play is necessary. It is a necessary offering unto the Lord. Just in the same sense that the service of the tabernacle in the wilderness could not have began as the Lord desired had each tribe not brought exactly what they were supposed to bring on the exact right time for the service of the Lord. As we said a couple of weeks ago in our unity service with the other communities, in John, uh, the Lord says, Yeshua says that uh, the, the world around us will know us and know who sent us based off of whether or not we are uni in unity. Uh, John chapter 17 verse 20 says, I pray not on behalf of these only, but also for those who believe in me through their message, that they all may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, so also may they be one in us. So the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them as you love me. We may be individuals within a grander body. We may be individual parts with our own individual roles to play. But it is necessary for us to work together in unity because we're part of one body. The body of the Spirit of God. 
the body of Messiah. That is it. It doesn't matter our role, our function, or where we come from. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're a guy or girl. None of that matters. We all are equally, vitally important. And if we don't operate in our unique gifts and talents, unified together in the Spirit of the Lord, then Yeshua says the world around us will not know who sent us. They will not know who we represent. They will not know why we do what we do. And unfortunately, the body of Messiah is so fractured, so divided and broken. But in each and every one of, uh, uh, of the congregations in the body of Messiah, even as we see divides and splits occur, it's so important. Although we may be an individual congregation, that we operate as one, using our unique gifts and talents for that purpose. Because it's the same spirit that moves in each of us. Whether we like it or not, and we don't have any more of it than anybody else does. Just like we don't have any more of the breath of God inside of us than anyone else does. But it's there not for our purpose, but for His. That the world may know who sent us and be drawn to the Lord through what they see in us. And if we work and minister and operate and worship together as one, unified in the Spirit of God as a community, as a body, it's amazing what can happen in the world around us. And as we see, the next thing that happens in this week's Parsha, right after the, uh, the, the, the tribes each bring their own individual gifts that were exactly the same at the very end of Numbers chapter 7, verse 89, it says, When Moses entered, this is right after the anointing, the, the gifts were brought in the, the 12 days, the offerings were all made. Verse 89, when Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak without an eye, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the atonement cover, atop the ark of the testimony, between the cherubim. So he spoke with him. We want to see the Lord speak through us as the tabernacle of the Lord, as the dwelling place of his presence. We must be united as one, right. recognizing that we are no more valuable than the next and no less valuable than the next. That we each have a distinct and unique purpose. And we must be united and operate as one in the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father of mercy, we worship you. We love you and we adore you, Father. I thank you for your word, for your word, which is an ever-living reality. That no matter how many times we read through the scriptures, every time we open up a passage, it will speak to us new and fresh in our lives. That every time we open up your word, Lord, you revive us and restore us. That every time we dive into your presence, you energize us, Lord, and you move through and in us. Father, I pray that you bring unity like we've never experienced before. Father, I pray that your spirit moves in a mighty and powerful way as we come together as one, using our gifts and talents equally in your presence. Father, may the world know who sent us, know why we do what we do, and most importantly, who it is we represent. As we are the image and likeness of our Creator here on earth, operating in your spirit, by the blood of your salvation, that the world may not be lost, but come to know the truth in your salvation. In the name of Yeshua Messiah, we pray and everyone says, Amen.